Okay, so this is OB in gynecologic emergencies, uh, part B. So we just finished with delivering the baby, um, and now we have two patients to take care of. So this part is going to talk about talk, taking care of a, a neonate. So here's a baby just popped out. Uh, notice they're covered in slippery stuff. Um, hopefully crying. Crying is a good thing. So um, once they're out, we're going to dry them off um, and with a towel, keep them warm. We're gonna th that drying off and that uh, physical stimulation is what's going to stimulate them to breathe. Um, so we want to kind of vigorously dry them off and, and rub them. Um, again, we need to keep them warm, um, get them dry, and then wrap them in um, clean, dry stuff. Um, not uh, wet blankets. Um, the little OB kit should come with a little hat. Uh, go ahead and put the little baby hat on. Um, after baby is warm and dry and uh, if it's crying and uh, doing all right then um, the next place to put baby is right onto mom's stomach. Uh, or mom's chest um, and that will help keep baby warm um, and mom would sure like to hold the kid. Um, we don't need to rush to cut the umbilical cord. Um, wait at least a minute um, for it to stop pulsating. Um, if baby is uh, not breathing um, then go ahead and, and Again, don't cut that cord um, until you end up starting to do CPR. Uh, at that point, you want to go ahead and, and cut the umbilical cord. So you're going to measure out approximately seven inches from the baby um, and put a clamp and then measure another three inches, put another clamp, and then cut in between. And the reason we leave a long umbilical cord is um, uh, the hospital can do some umbilical IVs and stuff like that if it's uh, long enough there. Um, again, don't cut the cord if it's still pulsating. Wait for it to stop pulsating. Um, stimulating the baby is what um, helps baby know that it's time to start breathing. Um, so that's why uh, stimulating them is important. So this is kind of the general steps of uh, resuscitating baby. Um, so each one of these first little steps should take approximately 30 seconds. So we're going to dry and warm, um, suction baby's uh, mouth and then nose. Um, especially if there's any meconium there, you don't want to um, get any meconium down into the baby baby's lungs, so um, suction that really well. Uh, again, mouth and then nose and then mouth again is good. Um, dry them off with a towel, warm them, keep them warm. Um, if baby still isn't uh, breathing, crying on his own, then we're going to do some oxygen. Uh, so uh, blow by or a little mask. Um, and then do oxygen and, and drying and stimulating for a little bit. Um, if that doesn't get them uh, breathing on their own and, and pinking up, um, then we're going to start with some bag mask uh, ventilation with a, a neonate sized mask or BVM. Um, and then we're going to do that for about 30 seconds or so. And if that doesn't get the baby, uh, crying and responding well, then we're going to start chest compressions if uh, pulse is less than uh, 100. So that's what we can do as EMT basics. Um, if a uh, baby still isn't doing well at that point, um, a paramedic may consider intubation and then um, cardiac uh, ALS drugs. So doing CPR on a neonate, we're going to use uh, two providers. One's going to do the two thumbs uh, encircling hands technique. Um, the other is going to do the bag valve mask. And we're going to do a uh, ratio of 15 compressions, two breaths, um, at a rate of uh, 100 to 120 per minute. Uh, again, with Neonates, we're going to fix respirations first, um, so stimulate and then fix respirations. 
um, central cyanosis is uh, blue skin at the chest and head um, so a little bit of peripheral cyanosis in the, in the limbs um, is going to be normal uh, not something typically to worry about as long as it uh, clears up uh, within a few minutes um, artificial ventilation is going to be one every three to five seconds Um, so again, now we have two patients. Don't forget about mom, um, pregnancy and childbirth, um, carry a risk for serious bleeding, um, and blood clots, uh, can form and those can become emboli that will travel other places in the body. Um, so the placenta also needs to be delivered. Um, typically though, that can occur at the hospital. It's gonna uh, take some time. So there's usually time to go ahead and transport um, as long as mom's willing. Um, we're gonna control any vaginal bleeding. Um, we're gonna do that externally. We don't stick anything in the vagina. And then provide comfort to mom as best you can. Uh, so again, uh, we need to deliver the placenta eventually, um, but this is probably going to take place at the hospital. Um, and so the placenta, it'll have similar labor pains associated, so the feeling the need to contract there. Um, but again, we don't need to wait on scene to deliver that. Um, one way you can help control bleeding is to do a little uterine massage. Um, so while mom's holding baby there, if you can feel that uterus in uh, the abdomen there, you can do a little massage of that, um, and that'll help the uterus contract um, and uh, stifle any bleeding that's, that's occurring there. Uh, we need to remember to take vital signs frequently on mom, especially blood pressures. Um, the more comfort and care you can provide, the better. Um, anything that's gotten blood soaked or wet and uh, messy, let's get that cleaned up at this point. Um, this can be a, a messy affair, and so um, taking a little time to clean stuff up will make everybody happier. All right, so that was the normal childbirth. Um, so what uh, complications can arise? So this is a, a few complications here. Um, baby sitting sideways, transverse position, um, placenta abruptio, where the placenta is uh, becoming detached a little bit from the uterus, um, a breech presentation where something besides the head is coming out first, um, and then placenta previa where the placenta has uh, formed close to the uh, cervix. Which of these can you treat on scene? Um, the answer here is none of these. You need to transport. So again, breech presentation is anything but uh, the head coming out first. So whether that's feet, arms, um, butt, whatever. Um, and these typically are going to end up uh, as a C-section. Uh, and so we're, we're not going to try and deliver them um, unless the baby is um, coming out already and we have no choice whatsoever. Um, so here's a couple of different breech presentations, um, foot sticking out, arm sticking out. Um, neither of these do you in general want to try and deliver on scene. Um, prolapsed umbilical cord. Um, so this is a, a life-threatening emergency for the fetus here. Um, the danger is that the, the head of the baby coming through the birth canal will close off or pinch off that umbilical cord and um, then baby essentially is not getting any oxygen um, and will die. So um, if you see a prolapsed umbilical cord, uh, what you need to do is use a little pressure to keep baby from delivering um, and keep baby's head off of that cord. Uh, so that cord needs to remain pulsatile. 
uh, you're gonna go ahead and stick a gloved hand into the vaginal opening there. This is the one time where you're sticking anything in there um, and keep that baby's head off the cord. Um, and once you've got the baby's head off the cord, your your hand is there for the duration. Um, and it may be there for the duration all through a C-section. Um, for multiple births, so twins and or triplets, um, they're going to come out one at a time. Um, so it's basically delivery in serial. Um, so you'll deliver one, um, at least clamp the cord of the first baby, um, and then deliver the second baby. Um, essentially, this is just the same as one birth except multiple in a row. Um, remember, though, that these babies are generally a little smaller um, and are more likely to be needing um, resuscitation. For premature kids, um, these babies are especially prone to um, hypothermia, even more so than a standard neonate. Uh, keep them warm. Um, their airway is typically going to be uh, not as well formed, uh, not as developed, um, so they're going to need some assistance uh, with respirations usually. Um, so go ahead and um, if baby isn't crying, um, provide ventilations and chest compressions. Um, watch that umbilical cord for bleeding, perhaps. Um, give oxygen. Um, this is going to be a rapid transport. Meconium. So again, this is a sign of fetal distress. This is where the baby is uh, defecated into the uh, amniotic fluid. So. Um, in this case, you want to suction baby's mouth and nose um, very well before you do a lot of stimulating that baby to breathe. You don't want to get this uh, meconium stuff down deep in their airway. Um, if necessary, um, ventilations and compressions after you've suctioned the stuff out of the, the mouth and nose. So here's a picture showing some uh, meconium stained amniotic fluid there. Um, this can be an intense process and it's always good to have at least somebody else there um, helping out. Uh, let's remember at the end of the process here you're going to have two patients and so you're going to need uh, somebody caring for each one. Talk about some other emergencies that can occur during pregnancy. So we'll go through each one of these in a little bit more detail, but there can be excessive bleeding. Um, some small amount of bleeding during pregnancy is normal, um, but any excessive is uh, an emergency. We can have pregnancies in uh, places other than the uterus. Those are ectopic pregnancies. We can have seizures miscarriages, trauma, uh, stillbirths, and then accidental death. So um, again, some bleeding is going to be normal with pregnancy, um, some spotting, um, but any kind of excessive bleeding or profuse bleeding um, is something to worry about. Um, this can be with or without pain. Um, we do need to assess for signs of shock, as with any bleeding. Um, we're going to give oxygen and transport. Um, we're not going to stick anything in the vagina. We're going to do external bleeding control. So, two more common types of causes of pre-birth bleeding are abruptio placente and placenta previa. Um, so, in abruptio placente. Um, the placenta starts detaching from the uterine wall um, and the bleeding occurs between those two. Um, the blood may or may not exit the, the uterus and through the cervix out the vagina. Um, it may be somewhat minimal there. Um, with placenta previa, uh, the placenta forms close to or over the cervix um, and then you get some bleeding out the cervix uh, due to that. 
Um, how do you tell these apart? Um, abruptio placente is painful, um, and that's the main uh, discriminating factor there. Um, so there's going to be pain and tenderness. Um, may or may not have a lot of external bleeding, um, and this occurs in about 1% of pregnancies. Uh, with placenta previa, um, the bleeding is more often painless um, and is starting around 32 weeks gestation. Um, starts mildly and then increases, um, and this is in about 0.5% of pregnancies, so about one out of every 200. Ectopic pregnancies, um, so this is where the fetus starts developing somewhere else besides the uterus. Um, so uh, low down in the cervix, um, outside wall of the uterus or abdomen um, are the less common ones. Um, inside the fallopian tube is about 90% of ectopic pregnancies. Um, and we worry about that because there can be significant bleeding associated with this. Um, and this is a, a dangerous case of bleeding, or can be. Um, seizures during pregnancy, so um, eclampsia and preeclampsia is what we term this when you have seizures during pregnancy. Um, typical sign symptoms going to be increased blood pressure, um, excessive weight gain, sometimes this is associated with obesity, um, excess swelling, um, fluid retention, um, and severe cases, altered mental status. Um, once you get to seizing, then they're in eclampsia. Uh, miscarriages and abortions. Um, so some percentage of all pregnancies end up in miscarriages and abortions or spontaneous abortions. Um, Sign symptoms are going to be cramping and abdominal pains, um, some bleeding, and then discharge of that fetal tissue um, from the vagina. Um, care for these patients is going to be transport if necessary um, for uh, severe bleeding. Uh, trauma during pregnancy. Um, so just remember that in general, uh, pregnant woman's pulse is going to be 10 to 15 beats faster, so that's going to be a slightly altered vital sign. Um, there is excess blood produced during pregnancy, so. Um, uh, you might not see significant signs of uh, shock until um, you get a significant amount of blood loss. Um, and then it's going to be important to know whether the patient received blows to the abdomen and whether uh, the fetus may or may not have been injured. Um, one thing that can occur sometimes with traumas during pregnancy is a ruptured uterus where um, some of the uterus uh, tears um, and the fetus is no longer contained within it there. Um, stillbirths, um, so sometimes uh, just like with miscarriage and abortion there's going to be a stillbirth. Um, if it's obvious the baby is uh, beyond resuscitation then we're not going to do resuscitative events or uh, actions. Um, um, if baby looks appears could be viable, then obviously we are going to resuscitate. Um, life support where necessary, but often this is just going to be more emotional support um, for the family. Uh, when uh, late term pregnant female um, is accidentally killed, um, there is a chance that the unborn child can be saved. Um, if you do quality CPR on the mom, um, you can continue doing that um, until a C-section can be performed. Um, and uh, again, that could keep uh, blood flow and oxygen going to the baby long enough that the baby could be saved. 
Okay, so, uh, real quickly, some other gynecologic emergencies uh, not associated with uh, pregnancy and childbirth. So vaginal bleeding um, outside normal menstrual cycles um, can be a potential life threat. Um, so especially if there's associated abdominal pain, um, mostly we're worried about is that ectopic pregnancy. Um, if, but any kind of severe bleeding, um, we should treat like severe bleeding. So watch for shock, treat for shock, um, take vitals, transport. Uh, trauma to the external genitalia is going to be like trauma, soft tissue injuries to most other areas. Um, uh, look out for mechanism of injury. Um, is this not a commonly injured area? Um, use same-sex provider, so a female provider where possible to do the assessment and bandaging there. Um, uh, treat for shock um, and consider additional internal injuries to the area. Um, in cases of sexual assault, we want to um, obviously treat any immediate life threats, so control any bleeding, uh, control any threats to airway, etc. Um, but we don't want to do excessive cleaning of any uh, potential evidence, um, uh, or so we're not going to do any you know, detailed exam um, unless we need to get uh, some bleeding stopped. Uh, we don't want the, the patient to wash the area, um, or use the bathroom, or um, you know, cleanse wounds. Um, so all that can be evidence. Um, and we need to um, report any possible sexual assaults on to the, the hospital ER staff. Uh, and that's the end.